Here's an amazing list of zeros and ones. This integer sequence is known as the 2a Morse sequence. Let's check out some of its properties. This sequence is sometimes called the fair sharing sequence, because if you count the number of zeros and ones up to a certain given point, you get a graph that looks like this, where the yellow line counts the number of ones, and the blue line counts the number of zeros. If we travel along the curve y equals x, we see that both lines end up above y equals x roughly half the time. And at any given point, if you were to average out how many zeros and ones there were, they would always be roughly the same. So two people trying to share something can take turns, where one chooses every time there's a zero and the other one chooses every time there's a one. In this way, they should end up roughly with the same advantage. Let's see three different ways to build the 2a Morse sequence. First of all, we start with the number zero. We can take the zero and flip the bit so that it's one, and then append the one at the end, creating the sequence zero, one. Now take that sequence, zero, one, flip both of the bits to one, zero, and place the new sequence at the end of the original. Let's repeat it again. Take all four bits that we have, interchange them with their complementary bits, and place the four bits at the end like this. Once again, take all eight bits we have, interchange zeros with ones and ones with zeros, and place the eight bits at the end of the first eight bits. We can repeat this process indefinitely. If we do, the limit that we end up with is the 2a Morse sequence. Here's an alternate way to construct the sequence in the same manner. We start with zero, and then we continually walk through the sequence, taking the next entry that we haven't visited yet, placing two copies at the end, and flipping the second bit. If we do this indefinitely, we once again will end up with the 2a Morse sequence, as we can see that this is matching what we generated above. This second construction shows us that the 2n entry of the 2a Morse sequence is equal to the nth entry, and the 2n plus first entry of the 2a Morse sequence is equal to 1 minus the nth entry, starting with t0 equals 0. We now have a recursive formula. The third technique to generate the 2a Morse sequence comes from computing binary representations. We start with a number, compute its binary representation, take the base 2 digit sum, and then decide if that's even or odd. So with the number 1, the binary representation is 1, the base 2 digit sum is 1, and this is odd, so it has a parity of 1. For the number 2, the binary representation is 1, 0, which has a digit sum of 1, is also odd, so it gives us a 1 again. For number 3, the binary representation is 1, 1, which has a digital sum of 2, and therefore is even, so we give it a parity of 0. We can continue this process indefinitely, taking the binary representation of a number, adding the base 2 digits to get the base 2 digital sum, and then determining if that base 2 digital sum is even or odd, resulting in a 2a Morse sequence entry of 0 or 1, respectively. One way to write this is that the nth entry of the 2a Morse sequence is the base 2 digital sum mod 2. That means that we take the base 2 digital sum, divide by 2, and take only the remainder. The 2a Morse sequence has lots of interesting combinatorial properties. Here's one of them. Pick a binary word of your choice w. For instance, w could be 1101. Consider the blocks of the form 0w, 0w0, and 1w, 1w1 as pictured here. We can scan through the entire 2a Morse sequence looking for either one of these blocks. It turns out that you will never find either one of these blocks. Neither block appears, and that's true no matter what w you pick. The 2a Morse sequence is said to be overlap-free, according to this property. Let's investigate another combinatorial property of this sequence. Let's go through and count the number of ones between successive zeros. So between the first two zeros, there's two ones. Between the next two zeros, there's one one. Between the next two zeros, there's zero ones. And we keep doing this, counting the number of ones between the next two successive zeros until we get a infinite integer sequence made of twos, ones, and zeros like this. Pick any ternary word w, such as 01212, and consider two copies side by side of this block. Now let's look again through the entire new sequence to see if we can find this block 012120212. It turns out that no matter which w you choose, the repeated block pattern ww will never appear. This new sequence is called square free. Both these sequences were discovered by Norwegian mathematician Axel Tue in 1906 and 1912 papers. 
Here's another fascinating area where the sequence appears. Consider the integers from 0 up to 2 to the n minus 1. As pictured here, we're considering 0 up to 15, which is 2 to the 4th minus 1. Now, place the 2a more sequence below these numbers. Every time there's a 0, color the integer blue, and every time there's a 1, color the integer red. The 2a more sequence cuts these 16 numbers into two sets. Because this sequence is the fair sharing sequence, these two sets both have 8 elements in them. The 2a more sequence has cut these 16 elements into two equal pieces. But there's more we can say. Each of the elements in each set represents a line of blocks with that many blocks. It turns out that if you add up the total number of blocks given in both sets, you also get equality. So 1 plus 2 plus 4 added up to 14 is equal to 0 plus 3 plus 5 added up to 15. But we're still not done. It turns out we can use each element in each set to create a square array with a side length given by that number. Then if we add up the number of boxes in the total square arrays given by each set, we see that the two sets give us an equal number of boxes in this case as well. The sum of the squares of 1 up to 14 is equal to the sum of the squares from 0 up to 15. In this case we've seen that the number of elements in each set is equal, the sum of the elements in each set is equal, the sum of squares of the elements in each set is equal, and we can even show that the sum of cubes of the numbers in each set is equal. This property generalizes to other powers of 2 as follows. If we let E be the set of indices where the 2a more sequence is 0, and O be the set of indices where the 2a more sequence is 1, then the sum of i to the k where i ranges over e is equal to the sum of i to the k where i ranges over o for all possible k values from 0 up to and including n minus 1. The set E is often referred to as the evil numbers, and the set O is referred to as the odious numbers. One of my favorite properties of the 2a more sequence is when we consider the so-called turtle graphics associated to the sequence. We start with an arrow, and every time we see a 0 in the 2a more sequence, we move one unit in the direction the arrow's pointing. And every time we see a 1, we rotate 60 degrees counterclockwise. Here we've walked through the process for the first 32 entries in the 2a more sequence. We start to see a diagram emerge, but it's not clear what shape is actually going to arise from this process if we consider more terms in the 2a more sequence. To see the interesting shape that's going to emerge, we need to consider a lot more terms from the 2a more sequence. So let's go ahead and zoom out and see what happens when we look at the turtle graphics associated with the first 2048 terms of the 2a more sequence. Do you recognize this shape yet? Have you seen this shape before? Maybe we should zoom out even farther and see what happens when we consider the first 65,536 terms in the 2a more sequence. When we perform the turtle graphics on that many terms, this is the shape that arises. It seems truly unbelievable to me that such a straightforward sequence to build with simple rules and a simple process of turtle graphics can actually create the Koch curve, a fractal object with many amazing properties in and of itself. There are many other interesting occurrences of this sequence, but let's see just one more. If we consider this infinite product of the form 1 half times 3 fourth and so on, we get 0. On the other hand, if we consider the related infinite product where we flip all the fractions, 2 over 1 times 4 over 3 times 6 over 5 and so on, that product will go off to infinity. Here's an interesting thought. Let's start with the fraction product that converged to 0. And let's put the 2a more sequence underneath. Every time there's a 0 entry in the 2a more sequence, let's leave the fraction as is, and every time there's a 1, let's replace the fraction with its reciprocal, as we do here. What happens now if we consider this resulting infinite product of fractions? It turns out that this product converges to a finite number. Do you know what number this product equals? Pause the video if you want to think about this before I spoil the answer. It turns out that this product converges to the number square root of 2 over 2. Let's see how to prove such a fact. To prove this theorem, let's define two products. 
P is going to be the product that we're interested in. The product is n goes from 0 to infinity of 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 2 raised to the epsilon n, where epsilon n is minus 1 to the nth entry of the 2a Morse sequence. And Q is the product as n goes from 1 to infinity of 2n over 2n plus 1 raised to the epsilon n. Now let's consider the product P times Q, which we can obtain by sticking the products together. We can replace this with the infinite product from n equals 1 to infinity of the two expressions for P and Q multiplied together, where we leave the one half out in front from the n equals zero term of the product for p. Finally, we can see that the products multiplied together have 2n plus 1 in the numerator and the denominator, so those cancel, and the 2 in the numerator and the denominator cancel, leaving us with 1 half times the product as n goes from 1 to infinity of n over n plus 1 raised to the epsilon n. But now we can take the product p times q and we can split the infinite product into the two pieces where the numerator is even and the denominator is odd, and the numerator is odd and the denominator is even, like this. In the case when the numerator is even and the denominator is odd, the exponent is epsilon 2n, which can be replaced by epsilon n, according to the rules of the 2a Morse sequence. Similarly, the exponent's epsilon 2n plus 1 can be replaced by negative epsilon n, according to the 2a Morse recurrence. But then we can use exponent laws to write this latter product as an infinite product raised to the negative 1. Now something interesting has happened. These are the two infinite products that we'd seen before. And therefore we see that p times q is 1 half times q over p. Since pq equals 1 half q over p, we can deduce that p squared must be a half. And since we think p must be positive, that means p is the square root of a half or square root of 2 over 2. So we have proved that p is the square root of 2 over 2. An interesting sidebar is that we don't know the value of q. Can you figure it out? We have only scratched the surface of this fascinating integer sequence. If you want to learn more, check out the article, The Ubiquitous Pruitt 2A Morse Sequence, linked in the description.